Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, all the organizers. I know everyone here joins me in congratulating them on running a wonderful symposium that certainly is widespread, both chronologically and geographically. Let me just do my shameless advertising once more and remind you that there is another conference a year from now in Palermo, and we do offer travel fellowships. The program is set, but there are travel fellowships. There are flyers available either from Jonathan or I or at the desk on the Met, and we would welcome your applications. The subject is light in Islamic art and architecture. But today, our subject is from mosques to mosaic and mirrors. Islamic architecture and its decoration. And once again, we are looking widely across the Islamic lands, both in time and space. But we're considering here architecture not so much as bricks and mortar, but rather architecture as space, a space for ritual practice, that is mosques and shrines mainly, and the effect of decoration on those practices in those spaces. And that's decoration whether in terms of themes, such as floral or geometric motifs, or as materials, and here we're ranging again across time and space, either tile, mosaic, and other materials. We do have a packed panel, so I'd like to turn right now to our first speaker, Ruba Kanan. Ruba is head of education and scholarly programs at the about to be opened Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. She's also an, an adjunct professor at uh, York University there. She was chairman of Islamic Studies at York, where she taught Islamic art and thought. And her most recent publications are about inlaid metalwork of the 12th and 13th century. But today, she's talking on an entirely different subject, and that is the Friday Mosque Revisited, the meaning, function, and evolution of an architectural paradigm. Please join me in welcoming Ruba Kanan. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you all for being here on the Saturday morning. Um, in order to address the question of the meaning, function, and evolution of the Friday Mosque as an architectural paradigm, I have first to take you on a journey to the Sultanate of Oman on the southeastern tip of Arabia, where I carried out a survey of historical mosques back in 2001. The richness and variety of Oman's landscapes seen here on the screen is clearly mirrored by a variety of mosque types that reflect region regional influences and doctrinal beliefs. Whereas, the coastal Oman, where, whereas coastal Oman is predominantly Sunni Shafi'i, with arcaded mosques and domes and minarets seen here on the right, the country's mountainous region is Ibadi, and just a reminder who the Ibadis are. Ibadis are a school of legal interpretation that can be traced to the Kharijite movement in the first Islamic century and now exists only in Oman and parts of North Africa. And this is just a reminder because it will be relevant when we discuss the meaning of Friday mosques between the different groups for the different groups. So a typical mosque of Oman's Ibadi interior is usually small in size and raised on a platform. It has no tower minarets, no domes, and a flat mihrab. Take, for example, the mosque of Nizwa al sharqa with its small prayer hall and striking simplicity. The flat roof of the mosque rests on the outer walls of, and, and the interior arcades that run parallel to the qibla wall. The arcades are supported on a central column that really blocks the central access to the mihrab. A long flight of steps from the terrace leads to the rooftop, indicating that it was probably used for the call for prayer. The qibla wall on the interior is dominated by a carved stucco mihrab bearing an inscription that contains the names of the patron along with the name of the stucco craftsman and a date of 1518. What is important for the purpose of this paper is that these typical Ibadi mosques do not have pulpits or mimbars for the Friday sermon, as they are meant only for the obligatory daily prayers. The mosque type that we generally identify as the Friday mosque that forms the historical bulk, uh, the, historical, uh, the bulk of the historical mosques surviving in places such as Istanbul, Cairo, or Isfahan is significantly limited in the Ibadi interior of Oman. There's only evidence, actually, of six Friday mosques in Oman before, prior to the 1970s. These mosques are distinguished by their 
stepped minbars and very large mihrabs um, and uh, decorated with stucco. And these minbars are significantly different from what we find in the Ibadi, in the Shafi'i coast of Oman, where we have these combined mihrab minbars. And this is something I'll, I'll be happy to talk about in the question answer period. It's not a part of the paper for today. Now, the main question for me back in 2001 was how come there are such a limited number of the Friday mosques in Oman, a vast country that is the size of the United Kingdom? And I only recently um, came to explore a satisfactory answer, and this is what I'm sharing with you here. Scholars like uh, uh, Paulo Costa, who published a book on the mosques of Oman in 2001, attributed limi the limited number of Friday mosques to the conservatism of the Ibadis, an argument that I questioned uh, then, not only because Ibadi mosques have some far from conservative features, such as large stucco mihrabs, carved stucco mihrabs, embedded with imported Chinese blue and white ceramics, including some of them with uh, imported phoenix, uh, cer uh, blue and white uh, phoenix, uh, ceramics with phoenix on them, set in the center of the mihrab. And I published those in 2008. But I also questioned this notion of conservatism because I recalled being equally surprised many years earlier by a statement in the Encyclopedia of Islam's entry on minbar that states that dates the introduction of minbars in more than one city to the Umayyads in 749, more than 100 years after the death of the Prophet. Iman Oman's limited number of Friday mosques also reminded me of Ernest Herzfeld's fourth installment of his Damascus Studies of Architecture, which was published in Ars Islamica in 48, where he discusses the habit of not having more than one Friday mosque in a city. Bearing that in mind, the limited number of Friday mosques in places like Oman only served to raise two questions in my mind. First, the art historical discourse on the Friday mosque predominantly focuses on issues of style and patronage. So what do we really know about the Friday mosque as a history and a function? And second, can a discourse on the Friday mosque by a peripheral minority like the Ibadis of Oman inform the art historical understanding of the Friday mosque and as an architectural paradigm? And this paper will attempt to address both of these questions. So let us first review the evidence from Damascus and Baghdad. In his studies on Damascus architecture, Hertzfeld suggests that because traditionally no town had more than one Friday mosque with a khutbah, the great Umayyad mosque of Damascus built in the early eighth century remained the main and only Friday mosque in the city until a new mosque was built in the suburb of Salhiya, seen here on the upper left, in the suburb of Salhiya in 1202. What Herzfeld, what Herzfeld didn't question is the fact that the presence of a single Friday mosque in Damascus from the early 8th century to the 13th century means that for almost 500 years, only a limited number of worshippers could have performed the Friday prayer in Damascus. And I tried to play with the figures to see if we can assess. And, um, and actually, if we, if we can, um, the number of worshippers could be a maximum of 4,000 worshippers in the prayer hall and 3,000 in the courtyard. And there we're talking about them being really stacked like sardines. I didn't take into account these, these structures. What is, so the unique position of the great Umayyad mosque as the sole Friday mosque in Damascus for 500 years conforms to Ibn Asakir's early 12th century description of the city where he mentions one Friday mosque in contrast to 244 masjids in uh, intramuris and 170 ma 178 masjids outside the city wall. By the 14th century, the historian Al-Irbili, a 14th century historian, he lists two Friday mosques inside the city walls, the Great Umayyad Mosque and the Mosque of the Citadel, of course, and 15 Friday mosques across the city outside the walls. This suggests that Damascus had 17 Friday mosques in the 14th century, and according to an Naimi who died in 1520, this number dramatically raised in the early 16th century to 31 Friday mosques within a few years of the Ottoman conquest. And by that time, the population of Damascus we know was around 52 to 57,000. 
In short, there seems to have been no change in the number of people able to perform the Friday prayer for 500 years. The increase of the number of Friday mosques started under the Ayyubids, of course, and then a significant increase took place under the Ottomans. If we look at Baghdad, the situation seems to be similar. In his book on the topography of Baghdad, Jacob Lassner discusses the Friday mosque based on his translations of the 11th century history of Al Khatib al Baghdadi. Briefly, he informs us that the first mosque built by Abu Jafar al Mansur at the center of the round city was later replaced by a larger mosque in 809. We are also told that later in the 9th century, the Caliph al Mu'tadid al Billah was informed that there wasn't enough space for worshippers in the round city, which compelled people, and I quote, to pray in places which prayer was not permissible, end of quote. So the mosque was enlarged again in 894. Al Khatib al Baghdadi then justifies the building of additional mosques in the outskirts of the city beyond the walls. For example, in 940, the Caliph al Muttaqi built the Al Baratha Mosque uh, with the justification that it technically falls beyond the canal, which is considered the western boundary of the city. Also interesting is Al Baghdadi's narration of the Friday Mosque built at the Fief of Um Jafar in 990 where, and I quote, this request to establish a Friday mosque was based on the assertion that the mosque was situated beyond the moat which divided it, divided, uh, divided it from the town, or al-Balad, thus making the area in which the mosque was situated a town in its own right, end of quote. The geographer al-Istakhri mentions the increase in the number of mosques in the 10th century Baghdad from two to five. In comparison, Baghdad at that time had more than 10,000 public baths. So the architectural and historical evidence, which you know, is sketchy just because of time, seems to suggest that during the early periods, the Friday mosque was the exception rather than the norm. If we as art historians understand the Friday mosque to be the central emblem of Muslim religiosity, how can we explain their sporadic presence in the Muslim medieval cities? I think no one in this room will be surprised that the late Oleg Grabar had addressed the issue of the Friday mosque, and that's in, the late, in 1969 in uh, Lapidus's book on the Middle Eastern city. Grabar investigated the historical development of mosques in Muslim urban centers in the context of the debate on the Islamic city. In an attempt to theorize the th city through its mosques, Grabar turns to Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah, where he's surprised to find that the main discussion of mosques is located in the section of the of related to the Imam, where Ibn Khaldun distinguished between the Friday mosques, jamas, and the regular masjids based on the role and authority of the Imam of the mosque. What's interesting is that Ibn Khaldun then mentions in passing that the presence of the Friday mosque is necessary, and I quote, only for those who consider the Friday service necessary, end of quote. What Grabar concludes from these observations is that the Friday mosque has a legal definition as a place of prayer, that the hierarchy of amongst mosques, that is masjids and jamas, is based on the mosque's direct relationship with the institutions of the imamate and that there seems to be an uneasiness amongst Muslim medieval scholars towards the institution of the Friday mosque. In the last section of this paper, oh, I'm skipping Cairo because I had to cut it short. In the last section of this paper, I will examine Grabar's, Grabar's observations from a Muslim legal perspective and demonstrate that there exists an extensive discourse on the meaning, function, and history of the Friday mosque that is yet to be explored. For the sake of time, I will use an Ibadi legal source and bring, the picture, uh, bring into the picture Sunni, Hanafi, and Shafi'i sources. And I should say right at the beginning that I have not yet explored the Shia sources on the Friday mosque, but I wouldn't be surprised to find uh, similar trends. In a series of legal opinions, responses or jawabat, issued by the Ibadi scholar Nuruddin Salimi, we find the following question. Why don't Ibadis pray the Friday prayers, even though it is an obligation in the Quran? The question, which is clearly didactic in nature, is asked with the purpose of discussing legal proofs 
and, uh, and their sources, and as such, suitable departure for our discussion here. And of course, this question comes from 19th century collection. I'm using it here because it's the most direct discussion for a short paper, but in the written paper, I'll give you the evidence in the sources from the 8th century onwards. And of course, when I saw this question, I realized I wasn't uh, wrong in suspecting that conservatism is the reason that there's no Friday mosques. Now, Astalami's answer can be paraphrased into the following. First, regarding the obligation of the Friday prayer. Yes, Astalami answers, Friday prayer is an obligation in the Quran and the Sunnah. This obligation derives from the Quranic verse, Surah 62.9, O ye who believe, when the call is heard for prayer on the day of congregation, Juma, hasten to the remembrance of God and leave your trading. As Salimi then explains that the clarification of the particulars of the Friday prayer were taught through the traditions and actions of Prophet Muhammad, in the same way that the practices of other ritual obligations, such as daily prayers, almsgiving, and pilgrimage, were taught. Then as Salimi argues, then based on the Sunnah of the Prophet, the Friday prayer is an obligation only under certain conditions, mainly with an imam and in a misr. And just for simplicity, the misr will def define it now as generally city, and I'll go into the explanation. In addressing the two uh, conditions, imam and misr, as Salimi turns to hadith in order to demonstrate that the sunnah of the prophet, uh, uh, that in the sunnah of the prophet, Friday prayer is conditional. And as such, it's very different from the daily ritual prayers, which are obligatory and unconditional. In one hadith, the Prophet is reported to have said, and I quote, four things are a prerogative of the imam, the collection of war booty, the collection of voluntary almsgiving, the dispensation of legal pun punishment, and the holding of Friday prayers. The sunnah then indicates that the need of an imam is a condition for the obligation of the Friday prayer. And this goes across all the different uh, traditions of legal interpretation. As Salim's evidence for Misr as a condition for the obligation of the Friday prayer uh, um, also comes from the Sunnah. Again, he always, tra like tr traditional scholars, first quotes a hadith, and it's a very common hadith, hadith uh, sahih, which is no Friday prayer except in an all-encompassing town, and the term is al-Misr al-Jama'. He then reminds us that during the Prophet's lifetime, the performance of the Friday prayer in Medina took place only in the Prophet Mosque, even though Medina itself was com composed of several suburbs. And the historical sources have lots of references for people trying to walk into the, to Medina to pray Friday prayer and being told there's no obligation, you don't have to, you live outside the city, don't worry, you don't have to do that. It was only during the caliphate of the second caliph, Omar, who ruled from 634 to 644, that seven additional locales, mostly garrison towns, were designated as Misr and allowed to hold Friday prayers. Those locales were Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, Yemen, Sham, and Bahrain and Oman jointly as a single Misr. These were the only places where the Friday prayer was held until the Umayyads started their building program in the early 800s. So what changed? And why did the Friday mosque become the norm? The answer lies in the difference in the legal definition in the term imam among the various schools of legal interpretation. According to the Ibadi creed, the imam is the best man elected for the leadership of the community based on his knowledge and piety without any regard to race or lineage. These elected imams have the prerogative of leading the Friday prayer. So the concept of the great imam is compared by a salami, by a salami to, um, to, to the Caliph Omar and as such was the only, uh, sorry, to the Caliph Omar and not the Imams leading prayers in the seven Misrs designated by Omar. The Ibadi understanding of the term Misr is also discussed by Salimi, where he explains that the coastal city of Sahar on the north coast of, car the current capital, uh, of Oman's current capital, Masqat, was the only Misr originally designated by Caliph Omar, and as such, the only place where Friday prayer was held in Oman. Thus, as Salimi explains, Ibadi Imams who did not live in Suhar, as indeed most of them didn't, ended up not performing the Friday prayer. 
Indeed, during the lifetime of the Ibadi Imam, Al-Warith bin Ka'b al-Kharusi, who ruled between 796 and 808, no Friday prayers were held in Nizwa, where he lived and ruled from. The legal principle here is that all of Oman is a single Misr, and that the villages and towns of Oman can be compared to the villages around Medina during the lifetime of the Prophet. The Ibadi discourse on the Friday prayer and Friday mosques is by no means unique. It reflects a broader debate in Muslim legal literature about the conditions of the validity of the Friday prayer, the legal definition of cities, and the nature of political power. For example, the Shafi'i scholar Ibn Kaj, who died in Damascus in 1015, argues, and I quote, the Juma, the Friday prayer, is an obligation that is incumbent on the whole community that can be fulfilled by some of its members, so fard kifaya. But it is an individual obligation, or fard ayn, for those who are living in the masr of the imam, or those who have a wali appointed in one of the seven masrs. So even for the Shafi'is in the 11th century, from a legal perspective, it was only incumbent on few members of the community, specifically those living in the seven cities uh, designated by Omar. Let me conclude. In his article, The All-Embracing Town and Its Mosques, Barbara Johansson examines the manner in which 24 Sunni jurists writing between the 8th and 19th centuries defined the term al-Misr al-Jama'. The technical legal term denoting a town in which the Friday prayer may be validly held. While the term al-Misr al-Jama seems to have developed during the 8th and early 9th centuries, the use of the term Jama to denote Friday mosque in legal texts seemed to have developed later and became common in legal texts dating only the 11th century. So before the 11th century, there were only references to masjids. What seems clear from Johansson's work is that within the Sunni Hanafi school, there evolved, a, uh, the, there evolved different criteria through which a, loco, a locale became identified as a masr and as such became a place where the establishment of the Friday prayer and the Friday mosque was valid. One of Johansson's significant findings in his article is, and I quote, there was an undercurrent of pious opposition against the recognition of several Friday mosques in one town that can be read about in the law books until the 19th century, end of quote. In short, both the material evidence survi of surviving uh, Friday mosques prior to the 11th century and the evidence from Sunni legal sources confirm that there was an epistemic shift in the understanding of the obligation of the Friday prayer. Based on the Sunni scholars' ijma, or legal agreement, Friday prayer became, became, came to be understood as an individual obligation on all accountable Muslim men, and thus more Friday mosques were allowed to be built, and we see the evidence from the Ayyubid period onwards. Where Ibadis seem to differ from other schools of interpretation, such as, as Hanafis and Shafi'is, is that they adhere to the, definition, the early definition of Imam and Misr. Let me finish by highlighting two points for future research. First, that one cannot use the notion of stylistic regionalism to dismiss all types of differences, especially for something as central to the study of Islamic architecture as the Friday mosque. Difference can be in many cases can in many cases reflect more nuanced realities embedded in the diversities of legal interpretations among Muslims. This also suggests that any discussion of mosque architecture can and will benefit from understanding the institution of ritual prayer. The second point to explore is that a long durée approach to the Friday mosque inevitably raises many questions about the cities in which they are built. The legal definition of Misr, its interpretation to the, its relationship to the Friday mosque, and its role as a paradigm in the Muslim urban life, I would argue, will inevitably raise the long forgotten debate on the Islamic city. Thank you. Thank you, Ruba. And I think what she's showing us is how our field is evolving and how things that we have accepted as, oh, I know about that, really deserve a second look. So I think we have time for one or two questions. Do we have some questions? And if you could go to the microphone, Renata, I see you approaching the microphone. So there you are, coming out of the darkness into the light. Um, thank you very much. Um, as you know, I 
really interested in this whole Ibadi business. Ibadi, yes. Zerba. Uh, and uh, two comments and then a question. Mm -hmm. um, there is actually even a further complication uh, in terms of utilizing um, the opinions, legal opinions, and then looking at uh, the material on the ground. And that is that um, as a way of um, protecting oneself uh, from the other sectarian uh, zone, and here I'm speaking about Jerba and yes. the bodies on Jerba, what they do in the medieval period is that they declare that the territory of Jerba is not a mister, i.e. that this, this is a karia, which means that they're just villages. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they don't have to have a jamia, mm -hmm. period. Yes. This is um, in opposition to the earlier settlement of the Ibadis in the Mzab, where in fact you have, because there was an imam of the Rustamids, they yes. have it. Now, when the um, Sunnis come um, in, uh, first as, a, as an expedition in the 14th century, and we have a commentary on, of Sunnis on this strange island, uh, they explain the absence of a jamia uh, by saying that the Ibadis uh, you know, refuse to have Friday prayer uh, because they say that there is no Imam al-Adl. That mm -hmm. is, yeah. the, the absence of a, just, uh, of a just Imam means that you don't have to have that, and it's only the just Imam that allows you to have uh, an Imam, imam al-Adl. Um, when you have the Ottomans then taking over, what happens here is actually a very interesting thing, that the Ibadis then, um, by consensus, switch the names of every one of their masjids into Jamia. Mm -hmm. And so to me, what's fascinating here is to try and, uh, I, I understand that you're using um, the Ibadi 19th century commentary um, uh, no, as a theory the uh, yeah. way, but uh, uh, on the ground truth is actually probably quite different um, area by area um, as a way of protecting themselves from real Sunni oppression, and let's not kid ourselves, yeah. there was such, they essentially put a cloak over every one of these, I mean, 10 man mosques. They're tiny things. They're tiny things. Calling them Jamia. Um, thank you so much, Renata. I'm actually, I follow both your work and Barbara's on the bodies of, uh, yeah. especially the, the work in Jerba. And um, let me first say that um, I brought the example of the 19th century because it's the clearest for a general audience. Uh, the earliest examples are very, very detailed. So when I, what I did with the Ibadi examples is I actually used the, the early ones and used them in contemporary to the mosques that I've, did, I've done sure. a survey of 120 mosques in yeah. Oman. So I'm very, very aware of the trick of using Ibadi, of legal sources if they're not relevant to the time and the space. Yeah. And I would certainly say that no one should use a legal source from the 19th century to discuss something in the 8th century, but I'm doing it because I yeah. can trace it and it would be easy for a short talk. The other thing is um, when they call themselves self Qariya, they're clearly calling themselves not a Misr. So that yeah. raises the question, so I don't see a disagreement there. Yeah, yeah. Where I would question is the notion of Imam al-Adil because the, all the arguments that I've read, and I've read both Ibadi and Sunni from the 8th century to the 19th century are in agreement that the Imam, whether the Imam is Adil or not, is irrelevant. So it's just the presence of the Imam. It doesn't have anything to do with Imam al-Adil, and it's closely and deeply discussed. And you're absolutely right. In times of oppression, um, there is the cloaking of identity. And this is why I focused when I looked on Oman, where until the 70s, 1970s, there wasn't a question. It was predominantly Ibadi and continuously so. So, so I could, in a sense, match and look at the architecture with the legal sources, whereas in North Africa, it would be very problematic because of the history. Yeah. And when the Ottomans come, I personally believe that the Friday Mosque is you know, predominantly an Ottoman phenomenon. This is where right. you stop seeing that very um, deep anxiety among scholars about, oh my God, we're opening another Friday Mosque. It, this is where you really see it. Yeah. It still lingers. Ibn Abdin in the 18th century Damascus also questions why are we having all these Friday Mosques. Mm -hmm. but if one thinks of the fact that the Friday mosques are not, uh, the Friday prayer is not like a regular prayer, you have dispensation not to do Friday prayer if it's raining outside, yeah. if you feel too tired to go to the mosque. Why? Because it's not an obligation, right. a general obligation. Yeah. 
So thank you so no, much. I, you. I, right. I would love to have a comparison. Right. With later, later. <laughs> I think in, in terms of time, let me just make one short comment. This is a question that does extend to Shiites, and there is yes. a big controversy in the Safavid period that Susan Babai has written about, mm -hmm. um, where the position changed, and under Abbas, they tried to, man to make mandatory the um, Friday prayer. And she explained the lack of mosques, of Friday mosques built under the early Safavids as a differing position. Yeah. So I think that, that you could easily extend to oh, that, that period as well. That is wonderful because, as, as I yeah, said, I, 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 I came clean that I haven't yet read them. It's, but, but, it's, you really have to do a sweeping survey well, of the sources. Well, I think sources. what you're pointing out is that our global approach needs to have regional focuses yes. and chronological ones as well. So thank you very thank much you for so a much. very stimulating paper.